course, and, and the way people have practiced history is anti-psychiatrically reductionistically. They want to leave out everything that's psychiatric or even generally often psychological. And the facts are obviously to be interpreted. That's the case with anything. But um, it's a mistake when you ignore facts so that you make no interpretations of them. What? For instance, yeah. Martin Luther King and Lama Gandhi made suicide attempts when they were right. preteens. That's been ignored by everybody. We may differ on the interpretation of it, but we shouldn't ignore it. No, I agree. But I think the, uh, the problem in part among historians is most historians don't do biographies. A small number do biographies, and some of them do them very well. Mm -hmm. And some of those actually have pretty good psychological insights, I must say. I mean, but, and some of them. Right, and it depends on when they were done and, and what's expected. Right? But, but most historians write about culture groups and other sorts of things. So yeah. I guess a good question might be, so how can we use the kinds of insights you've now brought in your new book to start social and cultural history? I mean, how would we, how would we be able to sort of carry that over? In well, I, you know, I think that my contribution here is, is consistent with social and cultural history. So what I'm saying is that in times of crisis, people with mania and depression or uh, more mild versions of, of those symptoms are better leaders than completely normal, average, healthy people. And that in times of non-crisis, the, it's the opposite. Normal, healthy people are better leaders than the mentally ill. So it's not just having the mental illness that's, what, that's what's needed, but it's the interaction with the crisis, with the social circumstances. And so people who are doing a social and cultural history, to the extent that that history is re relating to specific individuals, um, you know, this would be another factor, the biology, a factor in how it interacts. You know, it's interesting, when you talk, talk about mental health, because, mm -hmm. you know, I work, we work here, we have a program called um, Predictive Health, mm -hmm. but no one can define what we mean by health. Mm -hmm. No one, because we don't know what we mean by health. Mm -hmm. And so it's a sort of big black box. Mm -hmm. And so, but you actually draw on a definition, mm -hmm. ironically, from a very famous psychoanalyst, mm -hmm. Roy Brinker Sr., mm -hmm. And when you read what's normal from Krinkers, which I think more or less you endorse, mm -hmm. right? They seem like the most boring, uninteresting. <laughs> I mean, who'd want to be normal if that's what normality is? Right. And so, you know, you could, you know, only one. The person who's making this film right now works on addiction. <laughs> We're not allowed to bring her in, but but I, I have a graduate student, a PhD student, who's working on addiction. And one of the things that's clear when you look at a history of addiction is is that humans have constantly tried to alter their consciousness mm -hmm. through substances, mm -hmm. right? So therefore, is there such a thing right, as normal? Because you know, normal, if normal means you're not trying to alter your consciousness, you're doing anything about it, it means essentially like you're to have a very boring existence. Mm -hmm. So maybe, Maybe this line, maybe this whole notion of normal needs more investigation. Well, I, I think that that is part of what what I'm getting at here, and I think that you know that people have had positive and negative reactions to my ideas, almost in an allergic, immediate way. And I think that on the negative side, it may have to do with stigma against mental illness, kind of a prejudice like racism that's unconscious. But there's another aspect of it that may be more philosophical, because there's this been a long philosophical discussion about what health is and what illness is and also specifically what mental health and mental illness are. And um, I think the general, uh, one general idea that seems to be out there is that illness is inherently or necessarily harmful, and health is inherently or necessarily good. In other words, there's a value judgment, an ethical judgment that we attach to these concepts, which is debatable. You could defend it, but you could also defend the notion that illness and health are, could be seen from a purely biological scientific perspective and that our ethical judgments are extra, so that we could have diseases that are illnesses that are harmful and diseases that are illnesses that are not harmful. And you can have both at the same time, some harms and, and some benefits. And that's essentially what I'm describing. And because that goes against this, I think, this common but simplistic connection of the value judgment to illness is negative and the value judgment to health is good, it, it, it's confusing to people. 